So you made it this far, option A1, or is this just the beginning? Either way, here we are, staring at the face of option A, neurobiology and behavior. Really cool and fascinating stuff is going on here. As you can imagine, neurobiology is the study of how the nervous system develops and the biology behind all those shenanigans. While we'll definitely be discussing many living organisms, the focus here is on how humans develop. The ability for our brains to learn and react to stimuli, form memories, and ultimately how we behave. We will, however, step back and talk about phylum chordata. Chordates, which you should recall, are organisms that are distinguished by four things. A notochord, a dorsal hollow nerve cord, pharyngeal slits, and a post-anal tail. The first topic is A1, neural development. The essential idea here is that modification of neurons starts in the earliest stages of embryogenesis and continues to the final years of life. So, we are going to be focusing on how the nervous system starts to develop as the embryo develops and how it becomes the nervous system that we have come to learn about in 6.5. So onward and upward. In order to best understand this topic, we have to step back and look at the information we already should know. Oddly enough, the curriculum seems to airdrop us into the middle of embryogenesis without arming us with the required pieces or truly linking the content to what we previously studied. The first piece here is the link to topic 6.5, which discusses neurons and synapses. As you can see in the diagram, the nervous system consists of different parts. We focused before mainly on motor neurons, how nerve impulses travel, and how synapses transmit chemical signals. We got that covered, but we have to go back to basics and learn about how the whole nervous system develops and becomes specialized parts. In A1, we are mainly going to be focusing on the central nervous system and how the brain and spinal cord develops and how the peripheral nervous system develops. The other bit of background from 6.5 is the basic concept that the nervous system is composed of billions and billions of neurons that carry and transmit electrical impulses. If you need a refresher, go back and check out the lecture on 6.5. At this point, you should be able to understand the key parts and functions of a neuron, how nerve impulses are carried and transmitted. Really, the background knowledge is the vocabulary. I cannot emphasize that enough, the importance of knowing the terminology so that when you encounter it, it's not gonna be a punch to the gut. The last bit of background information is from 6.6 .6 and fertilization. The curriculum starts off A1 around this period of time called gastrulation, but it is important to know how we got here to see the bigger picture. So to refresh, when the sperm and egg unite, fertilization occurs and this one cell will start to develop. It will continue to divide into two cells, then four, then eight, then 16, until it becomes a morula. In humans, this is, this is around day four or five. This is the time that the fertilized egg gets a special name. Around day six or seven, it becomes a blastula or a blastocyst. Cells are starting to get organized and arrange themselves into different parts of the embryo. In humans, implantation occurs just around this time as well. The blastula gives rise to the gastrula, which is defined as the embryo or as an embryo that looks like a hollow shaped cup with three distinguishable layers, the endoderm, mesoderm or mesoderm and ectoderm. These are called germ layers. The ectoderm is the outermost layer, the mesoderm is the middle layer, meso being middle, and endoderm is the innermost layer, endo being inside. This is the background information, and it's hugely useful for you to better understand what happens next in the process to really get the bigger picture. So that was a lot of background info, but no worries, I know you're going to thank me later. You have now arrived at your destination, a gastrulated embryo. No, but for real. These three germ layers, the endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm, give rise to all tissues in the organism. And I mean everything. Right in the middle of all this, you can see the notochord, which as I just mentioned, is one key characteristic of chordates. The notochord is flexible, but contains all the directions for the embryo to develop the neural tube, which will become the spinal cord. The embryo undergoes this process called neurulation, or neurulation or however you want to pronounce it, neurulation, where over the course of a period of time will develop into the neural tube. However, remember that we're discussing a process, so looking at animated images is going to be your best bet to see it in action. Let's discuss this further while focusing on the diagrams. In the diagrams, the top set of images represents the whole embryo, whereas the bottom set only represents the top part of the embryo, which is the part of the embryo undergoing this process. In the first step, cells located in the outer germ layer remember this is the ectoderm, differentiate to form a neuroplate. The neuroplate then bends dorsally, which means toward the back, folding inward to form a groove flanked by neural folds, which is that part in light green. The neural folds close, and along with the neural groove becomes the neural tube. Parts of the neural folds also separate and form the neural crest. The enfolded groove closes off 
and separates from the neural crest to form the neural tube. The neural tube will elongate as the embryo develops and form the central nervous system, so the brain and the spinal cord. The cells of the neural crest will differentiate to form the components of the peripheral nervous system. If we think about the complete organism developing a neural tube, the cranial end, which is where the head or the brain will be, closes first, and then the closing off continues down the dorsal region of the organism to the caudal end, which is the tail end. It doesn't occur all at once. It starts at the top and goes to the bottom. You can see the second image on the right as well. And in class, we're gonna be looking at the top view. One of the skills that you need to know in option A1 is how to annotate a micrograph of a xenopus. As you can see, xenopus is a frog species that are considered model organisms for chordate neural development. Two reasons. First, they produce many eggs. So the number of eggs frogs lay, and the second is how sturdy and robust they are, and that their development is easy to see. What you need to know how to label are the three germ layers, so the endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm, the neural tube, the notochord, and the archenteron, which will give rise to the digestive system. And you can see all of that in the image here. In this slide, the same thing is visible with the structures in the embryo and the functions they will develop into as a fully developed organism, whether it be tadpole or frog or human. During development, complications can and do arise. One of the major complications related to the closing of the neural tube is a condition known as spina bifida. As I mentioned previously, the closing off of the neural tube occurs starting at the cranial end, so the head, and continues down toward the caudal end, the tail. Sometimes, the neural tube doesn't close entirely, and this results in a condition that we know as spina bifida. It's most commonly seen in the lumbar and sacral areas, which is near the lower part of the back, as this is where re the closing off occurs the slowest and is incomplete. The vertebral processes don't fuse leaving the spinal cord nerves exposed and prone to damage. The severity of the condition can vary from mild to severe depending on the consequence of the incomplete closure. In more severe cases, patients may typically suffer some degree of paralysis as well as bowel and bladder dysfunction. A few different types of spina bifida are shown in the diagrams here. So how is this condition caused? There's not one specific thing, and spina bifida is believed to be caused by a combination of genetic and environmental factors. However, not having enough folate in the diet during pregnancy is believed to play a significant role in causing spina bifida. Folate is also known as folic acid or vitamin B9. In many countries, packaged food is supplemented with folic acid, and this is yet another reason why potential mother mothers should make sure to get proper nutrition. As I previously mentioned in the neurulation slides, the neural folds will become the top part of the neural tube. Some of those cells from the neural fold will become the neural crest, both the neural tube and crest contain what are called multipotent neuronal stem cells that can differentiate to form different types of nerve cells. In our bodies, we have two major types of nerve cells, neurons and glial cells. Neurons that form from neuronal stem cells will become motor, sensory, or relay neurons. Remember that relay neurons can also be called interneurons. These three types send and receive signals. On the other hand, glial nerve cells provide neurons with physical structure and support, both physical and nutritional, in order to help carry out their functions. The process of neuron formation is called neurogenesis. Most neurons survive for a lifetime of the individual and do not proliferate during or following embryogenesis. They're what are called post-mitotic, and they don't undergo cell division. However, certain brain regions may be capable of adult neurogenesis, but most of the nervous system is incapable of regenerating. This is why damaging and destroying nerve cells means that once they're gone, they likely will not regenerate. It is important to understand that when neurons form, they have to get from point A to point B, which is the final destination. Once neurons arrive at their final destination, they become specialized further and take on more specific roles at that portion of the nervous system. So how do nerve cells migrate? Neural migration may occur via one or of two distinct processes, glial guidance or somal translocation. And you can see this in the animation below. In one way, glial cells may provide a scaffolding of network along which an immature neuron can be directed to its final location. Alternatively, the neuron may form an extension at the cell's perimeter and then translocate its soma, remember that's the cell body, along this length. This is called somal migration. In both cases, the immature neuron arrives at its destination, but remember this key point. It only contains a soma, which is the cell body, and it has a nucleus and a cytoplasm. The rest will develop once it arrives. So this includes all the other pieces of a neuron, including the dendrite, 
axon, axon terminals, synapses, myelin sheath, and so on. Once an immature nerve cell arrives at its destination, it has to make its full transition into becoming a fully developed nerve cell. Remember that it only has its cell body and nothing else. So it's kind of pobrecito. At this point, axons and dendrites begin to develop in response to chemical signals from surrounding cells. As those axons start to spread out or extend out, they have a growth cone, which is called a philopedia, which looks kind of creepy. It's got some little feelers that respond to these chemical signals. Some signals attract and others repel. This allows the axon to extend and begin to make other connections with fellow neurons. One recommendation for you is to watch some videos about neuromigration and neurogenesis. This will give you an idea about how it looks in real time in the process. A developing neuron will form many branches, some of which develop into the axon, and other branches that recede. It reminds me a lot of plant roots, or in the upside down in Stranger Things, which is kind of creepy. As a nerve cell finishes the process of neurogenesis, it will have all of the main parts of the nerve. It will then begin to really refine itself and transmit signals. Sending signals from one nerve cell requires a synapse. A synapse converts electrical impulses to chemical signals and sends them to the neuron it is connected to. However, neurons have to develop these synapses and connections. We've learned previously that a synapse is a junction at which a neuron transmits a signal to another cell. Developing nerve cells form many different synapses, and this leads to many different connections between nerve cells. The process of developing these connections is called synaptogenesis, and you can see all of the different connections in this image below. There are different types of connections between nerve cells, and you get a sense just by their names. Axodendritic, axosomatic, axoaxonic, and dendrodendritic. In all of these examples, the beginning part is where the transmission is coming from, and the second part is where it's received. For example, the axodendritic is sent from the axon of one nerve cell, and received by the dendrites of the receiving nerve cell. So in the developing organism, many, many synapses are created, more than are needed. This helps to maximize the connection possibilities. In humans, it begins as a fetus and ends roughly around the second year. At this point, the baby will be learning new things, making connections, and using different synaptic connections. Some of these connections get stronger and others get weaker. The process of getting rid of weaker and unused neurons is called neuropruning. It's no different than the pruning of a plant, where some connections are gotten rid of in order to make other connections even stronger. However, the main nerve cell body is still existing with some of the axons gotten rid of. In contrast, some nerve cells and their connections are killed off altogether in a process called apoptosis. In both, the connections between nerve cells is refined. This is associated with patterns of learning and is a combination of both genetic, but is a huge part environmental. You can see the difference in the image between the first two years of human development and how neural pruning occurs afterwards, making fewer and fewer connections. And this process continues all the way through adulthood until death. Similarly, our nerve cells are constantly refining their connections, strengthening some, while others atrophy, or kind of go away. Different connections are made, and rewiring of nerve cells occurs. Capacity for the nervous system to change and rewire its synaptic connections is called neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity enables individuals to reinforce certain connections, so learning, or circumvent damaged regions. Neuroplastic change can occur at small scales, for example, changes to individual neuron. Large whole brain scale, like as a response to injury. Brain function might move to a new area of the brain. And you can see this in the images below, showing the patterns of rerouting and sprouting. This reorganization of this architecture enables memory retention and learning. Growth of axons and dendrites is as much a part of neuroplasticity as pruning and apoptosis. Regrowth of axons can be up to five millimeters per day. Neuroplasticity is seen throughout the life of an organism, but brains show a much higher degree of plasticity during early childhood. So theories explaining memory and learning depend on the phenomena of neuroplasticity. And with learning, it is all about repeating a task so that you can make the neural connections in your brain stronger so that you're truly learning the activity or the material. For individuals that have brain damage due to strokes and other conditions like concussions, the brain can cope. Stroke symptoms may be temporary if the brain is able to reorganize its neural architecture to restore function. Following a stroke, healthy areas of the brain may adopt the functionality of damaged regions. This capacity for the restoration of normal function is made possible due to the neuroplasticity of the brain. As always, it's really important to give credit where it's due. While the presentation script and video are solely of my own creation, Many of the images and information contained in the presentation are not. So shout outs to the following. Most of the images and video clips come from IB Bio Ninja and some of the information used. Other images and info come from Bionology, 
iBiology, and Biology for Life. Lastly, some information was gleaned from the Cambridge edition of the IB Biology text, as the intended purpose of this presentation is to provide you with yet another resource tool to enhance your learning for the IB Biology curriculum. So super thanks to these guys.